Um, if you are a visitor here today, this is not our usual format. Usually someone will be up here speaking longer during this time. Uh, doesn't mean I'm going to be as short as I probably should be. Because um, I, I was told about 10, 15 minutes is the time for speaking today. So if you see a couple people get up, that's because I reached 10 minutes and they're done hearing me. <laughs> but um, when I was talking to Mark about doing this, I told him it was kind of difficult now after years of ministry that I have to go back to the very first sermon that I ever did in preaching class and try to get in the mindset of how do I do it in just 10 minutes. Uh, so what we're going to do instead is we're not going into 1 John today. I'm not going to continue the 1 John series because I could talk a half hour over one verse in 1 John. Uh, instead, I figured I'd actually give you guys a little glimpse of what we've been doing for our young adult Bible study. And uh, we've been going through a series called Something That Needs to Change. And speaking of change, this week was fun. Uh, Monday, I get a call from my wife as she's on her way home. And she asked, do we have everything we need to deal with a tire? I said, baby, <laughs> because uh, after moving so many times, I don't know which box our air compressors are in or anything else. Uh, lo and behold, she gets back to the house and she's only a mile and a half away or so. Well, in that mile and a half, two miles, by the time she gets to that house, the tire is half flat. By the time we get everything ready, it is completely flat. Um, there's a big, like an inch, inch and a half gash in the tire. So Tuesday, take the tire in to get fixed, and it does get fixed. And then later Tuesday night, realize that the full size spare that's on the Jeep at the time is also leaking air at four psi per eight hours or so and so take that in Wednesday to get fixed and then they said well they couldn't find anything wrong with it so they didn't charge us so by that time okay we've spent three days dealing with changing a tire uh, uh, dealing with something that needs changed when I wanted to be cleaning the garage and spreading grass seed and all those things so it goes to show you don't always count on your own plans because they'll change pretty darn quickly. So something needs change. Maybe sometimes you think to yourselves, I think we can all think of someone in our life when we were doing this study, thinking of someone needs to change. So there's someone in our lives that we might think of that, you know, they really need to kick that habit or they really need to start coming to church. I'd like to start getting them to come to church. Maybe, uh, you can, in the morning, you look in the mirror and you think, I need to change. Uh, I've felt that way with the, this morning. Tried on two different shirts and said, I need to lose weight. They don't fit right. Well, this series is Something Needs to Change. And this is the book right here, Something Needs to Change by David Platt. And it's over a seven day journey through the Himalayan mountains. And here's a little take home guide for the participants in the study guide, or in the study. And his whole purpose for this is he's going through this section of the Himalayan mountains near Nepal. And um, there's roughly in this entire region, uh, the city that they land in and the mountain ranges that they walk through and the villages they visit, uh, there's roughly 9 million people. And it's estimated out of those 9 million, there are 100 Christ followers. And as you're reading this book, you're count, if you count it, you probably meet half of those Christ followers in this book through these various villages and mountain ranges. And the whole purpose of this series is he wants us to Take, he wants to take us with him in this journey through the Himalayas and realize that not only does sometimes something needs to be changed, someone needs to be changed. Overall, the way we do ministry as a part of the body of Christ and in the church, something needs to change. Here I am talking so much, I'm not paying attention to what I need to be doing right there. Something needs to change. And he goes through several different things. Each day, it's crazy how his study through uh, the book of Luke, his personal study is through the book of Luke. Each day, something he is reading, it almost foreshadows something he encounters later that day. And uh, for example, um, 
the first day, he was talking, well, not the first day, it was actually the second day in the study, but the first point I want to cover is identifying and meeting the physical needs. And uh, through this journey, he sees people who um, have been chained to a barn because they have some disability that their village believes through the Buddhist beliefs or Hindu beliefs, depending on the village, that uh, they were born on a bad day or cursed. Um, he meets people who are just an entire village that's riddled with disease that a simple antibiotic could cure, but they have such a hard time getting it that the whole village is sick and possibly could be dying. He meets a man who actually is missing an eye because he has a bacterial infection that is eating away at his, at his inside of his skull. These things that we take for granted that uh, we have such easy access to as far as our medical care, and they are having such a hard time, he's realizing this day he is seeing and wants to know how can we meet the physical needs. And one of the things that he goes through on his study for that day is out of Luke chapter 5. Luke 5, 12 through 16. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. And this is, again, talking about Jesus here. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he reached out and said with his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell him no one, or tell no one, saying, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther, and large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed from their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. So there, what did Jesus do to answer that, that old question and bracelet from the 90s? What would Jesus do? Jesus healed him. He identified that this man had leprosy and healed him. So he, he saw a physical need. He met a physical need. Sometimes that can kind of be easier than other needs that we might see. Uh, maybe, well, maybe it's meeting someone's need as far as they have a family of five and they just need a little bit of gas money to make it through the week so that they get their kids to school and activities and such. So that's an easy need to, to meet. Uh, maybe when uh, we have a prayer request of needing food for someone recovering from a surgery or, or to celebrate and, uh, hey, someone just had a baby in the congregation, let's provide them food. It's a physical need that can easily be met, pretty easy. Uh, some of them are a little bit more difficult. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's someone that uh, uh, Wendell has been working with through the prison ministries and they have been baptized and go into his studies for years, and they get released and have nowhere to live and nowhere to work. Maybe it's someone stepping up and saying, i got a spare room, and I can help you get clothes for an interview and get you to a job interview, help you get on your feet. Uh, maybe it's something along those lines. Maybe it's something that we need to dive in deeper for and look to the spiritual and that's what another day, the next day, we had identifying and meeting the physical needs. And the next day after that, he starts going, it goes deeper than just physical. In a place with 9 million people and only 100 of them are believers, followers of Jesus Christ, it goes way beyond the physical. Meeting the physical needs is great, but we also need, and identify, uh, need to identify and meet the needs that are spiritual needs. And throughout the book of Luke, he, he goes from 
Uh, throughout this study, he's reading Luke chapter 3 to Luke chapter 17. He's encountering all these different things. And you can fill in your own mind throughout the Bible different examples of physical needs, different examples of spiritual needs through Scripture. But next we're going to go through, again, a little bit more out of chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verses 17 through 26. One day he was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of the Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying a man on a stretcher who was paralyzed. And they were trying to bring him, uh, bring him in to, and to set him down in front of him. But when they did not find a way to bring him to in because the crowd, they went onto the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven you. And, and the scribes and the Pharisees began thinking of the implications saying, who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sin except for God alone? But Jesus, aware of their thoughts, responded to them, Why are you thinking this way in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk? Excuse me. But so that they may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, <coughs> Uh, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. And immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And they were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were also filled with fear, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. So first, like here, at first when I was reading, I was thinking, oh, there's a physical need that is being met. Um, but he starts off by saying, friend, your sins are forgiven you because of the faith of his friends. Here Jesus is identifying something that's spiritually needed as well, our sins being forgiven, which we all need our sins forgiven. We all have those sinful natures. We are all fallen in the eyes and, and fallen short of the glory of God, and we all have those spiritual needs and too often we can forget that our neighbors have those spiritual needs as well. Uh, especially this time of season when uh, political debates and uh, situations are getting a little heavy uh, as far as the presidential elections and everything going on. But it can go down to uh, a season that just passed and uh, the Super Bowl season. A lot of disputes on whose team is better and who didn't make the Super Bowl and who made the Super Bowl and other things. But uh, it goes deeper than any of that. We, we can... Too often, we forget to look at people the way Jesus sees them. And we don't see the spiritual. We see the offense that's made against us or the thing that we disagree with. And instead of being a place that is a hospital for the sinners, uh, we can be a place that tries to bar the doors a little bit. Now that's not saying that we give people who are sinners uh, and unrepentant sinners or people who haven't experienced Jesus yet roles of leadership. No, but we do want them to sit right in these pews so that they can learn about Jesus and allow Jesus to change them, to meet that spiritual need. And uh, sometimes it means not being just within these walls, but stepping out. Uh, as I was going through this, I was looking through the um, missions in the directory and immediately was thinking of, of Casas, both in Juarez and um, Briar and uh, Brig and Laura and Connor Ferris, but I was also looking through the old directories and I was thinking of uh, something that, uh, oh, just the different missions that we have supported 
and uh, got me thinking of locally. We got, we got Tri-State. Um, I remember as a camper at camp going to help with service proje projects at the Chrysalis home. Um, uh, going to Macomb to help out a church with their church sign or to help sort clothes at the uh, former Salvation Army. And uh, we, we have these local things that are meeting physical and spiritual needs. And we have those who are going abroad. And, and sometimes... We don't know what God will be calling us to do so until he brings it before us, which means we have opportunities, but we also have to consider and count the costs. And that's something else that he was talking about later. He was spent a few days in this study going through the Himalayas, looking at physical needs, spiritual needs, and realizing that, oh, jumping, I'm jumping the gun here, there we go, realizing that uh, in order to make a difference, He's questioning whether God's called him to the Himalayas or not. He's got to step back and count the costs. Costs of serving Jesus Christ, the costs of moving forward with the potential ministry opportunity or missions opportunity. Uh, count the costs of what it means to say, yes, Lord, here I am. Use me. Uh, and because I think we can all relate to at times we have thought something needs to change. Thought, how can I change? How can I make a difference here? Uh, and we might start putting plans in motion, but maybe it's a little bit more than we originally anticipated and we, we stop halfway through, um, which is why I'm glad that we're talking about this. And Mark was talking about Midwest uh, training, ministry training through Jamie. Jamie has spent a long time counting the costs, figuring out what it takes to start the Midwest Training Academy, to get it going, the support that was needed, who he needs to talk to. Uh, he spent a long time doing that. Um, all of our missions that we support have spent time thinking about what it means to go overseas or to a different country to serve, what it's going to cost, not just financially, but personally, what needs to be sacrificed. And... They have not just thought of the idea, but actually figured out and planned how to get it going, which the people he was working with, David was working with here, have done that. Um, one guy named Aaron had spent years there. After visiting, he started planning, how can I make a difference there? And then he put everything in motion, sold his stuff in the States, went over and started organizing. Well, before he started going over, he started organizing how to establish schools and medical care and how to get to the different villages. And he's making a huge impact through God's power and guidance. But uh, something that David was reading through this was out of Luke 14 when it comes to counting the cost. And there, there's Luke 12 as well. Luke 12, there was the parable of the rich man who was building his barns, or uh, rebuilt his barns, who had this huge crop and, and didn't have enough space to build it. And so he tore down his old barns and built new, bigger barns so they could store all of his crops and, and realized, oh, I got plenty. We can relax and, and enjoy ourselves. And, and then essentially he died. <laughs> and then God said, you fool, why were you storing up so much stuff for yourself when you didn't know? They, whether or not you can enjoy it. You're, you're building treasure on, for yourself on earth instead of heaven. Counting the cost. Then he goes uh, out of Luke 14, verses 25 through 35. Now the large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sister, yes, even in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which is a big deal because cross was a symbol of death at that time. For which one of you... When he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost so that to see that he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and uh, is not able to finish, all who are watching will begin to ridicule him. 
saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish. What king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to face one coming against him with 20,000? Otherwise, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation to request terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciples who does not give up all of his own possessions. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt, even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either to the soil or the manure pile. So it is thrown out. The one who has ears, let him hear. So, oh, there we go. So that's what that button does. <laughs> All right. But uh, so something needs to change. And one of the things in this study he talks about is that, that phrase there. He said, all over the world there are half-built towers abandoned by Christians who had good intentions that did not count all the costs when they started out. And uh, that one got me thinking. I, know about, I don't know about you. I know I sometimes have a tendency to start something and I don't always finish it, um, which is the nice thing about being married. I have a wife that motivates me to finish something. Um, but I don't want to be one of those people when it comes to physical and spiritual needs if I'm going to start something and not finish it. Um, I, I don't want to be one of those people that would start off on, um, like for example, I had an idea when we left the children's home of trying to, trying to get something going. And it was just an idea in my head. Um, and I talked to Christine about it a little bit. But uh, to get something going to uh, kind of be a support system for people in foster care. Because uh, at times there was uh, plenty of advocates for foster parents in the area in, in Missouri, but no advocates for the house parents working at the children's home itself. So I was, how, do, how do we get some kind of support system for people in the foster care? Now, I took no steps at all. It got to something to where, it got to a point to where counting the costs, it was not something I could start. It was not something meant for me to start. So I didn't even start it. Because um, I did not want to be uh, getting the ball rolling, reaching out to some people for support, getting materials and, and anything, uh, a list of foster parents together. I didn't want to get to that point and then not be able to do it. So it was better to, after figuring it out, no, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, I don't want to be that person. I want to be that person that reaches out to 10 churches for a mission ministry of some kind, gets support, gets a pool of support going, financially, materials, and then never gets the mission going. And that's what we need to be careful of. We need to make sure that when God is calling us to do something, we are counting the costs of it to get it going, to make sure that it can be completed, that it can be moved forward with, whether it's something like working at Casas Per Cristo, whether it is one family, one purpose, what it, whether it is something locally at Tri-State uh, or something else that maybe God has laying on your heart, we need to make sure that as something needs to change to meet uh, these physical and spiritual needs, we are counting the cost to make sure that those opportunities can actually be put forth. And... Uh, he closed when he was talking about something needs to change. He started talking about Luke 15, parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. All three things, when they were lost, we, the people involved in these different parables searched. The shepherd left the 99 to find the one. He left the 99 safely in a field to find the one. Um, the owner of the coins stopped what they were doing and searched the entire house until they found that one lost coin. And the father, when the son left, when he came back, the father saw him from a great distance away and ran to him to embrace him with a hug, which tells us that every day the father would always look to see if his son was coming back. And 
with that, it, it, something needs to change. Who's that one? Maybe it's not some big ministry that we need to be involved with. Maybe it's just one person that we need to change our hearts for so that they can be reached with Jesus. Maybe it is a neighbor that you have a hard time with. Maybe it is a family member that you have fallen out with. Maybe it is someone you don't even know, but it's just one person that you can help make a difference in their life. Who needs to hear Jesus? What can we do to make sure that person hears Jesus? How can we serve Jesus and serve them by making a difference? Who is that one lost one that we're searching for? Something needs to change in our hearts to do that. Something needs to change in the way we represent Jesus Christ at times in order to do that. And definitely something needs to change in our community. And so how can we step forward, follow the will of Jesus Christ, change the way we view people within our community and make that difference. Something needs to change and usually it starts with us on how we're doing ministry and reflecting Jesus Christ. So that's my challenge for you today is maybe you are that one. Maybe you've been on the fence thinking about Jesus. Uh, uh, do I need to accept Jesus Christ into my life? Maybe you can think of someone who is that one that, oh, that's, a, that's the one person this week, co-worker, employee, family member, friend, neighbor, even maybe someone that you consider an enemy. They are the one that I can really try to reach out to, that I can be the light to, that I can reflect Jesus to. Find that one. And if you are that one and are thinking about, maybe I need to accept Jesus Christ in my life, here in a minute, I'll be up front. We'll have elders all around. Mark's over there. Dan's there. I mean, he'll probably come up and sing, but you can, I, I don't know, I wouldn't mind. If I was gifted with the ability to sing up here and someone wanted to talk to me, I'd stop a song so I could talk to you. But uh, there's plenty of people to talk to if you are curious. Or if you don't want to do it now, hit us afterwards, after the service is over, if you don't want to come up in front of people right now. Either way, don't let... Don't let nerves uh, keep you from asking those questions or, or pursuing Jesus. Uh, if you have any questions at all, please come talk to us. And if not, think about that one that you can reach out to. Because something does need to change. So, I'm going to pray. Dear God, thank you so much for today. I thank you all for all that you do. Uh, thank you for your word, and thank you for people who are trying to present your word to us in ways that help us to change the way we view things, how we view ministry, how we view other people around us. And I pray that you will change our hearts, change our minds, so that we can view people around us as you see them. Because uh, sometimes we can get too caught up in our own selfish desires, selfish things that we forget to view people the way you see them. And we don't see the opportunities right before us when it comes to making a difference. Help us to have the wisdom, the discernment, to see those opportunities you bring to us, the courage to take advantage of them and do something about it, and uh, lay the words on our hearts so that we can speak with your words, not our own, when it comes to sharing you with others. Help us to love people the way you love them, and help us to remember that each and every one of us are sinners needing the gift and grace that you have given us. Thank you so much for your son, his sal uh, the sacrifice and his gift of salvation to us through that sacrifice and resurrection. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.